I'd like to read you excerpts from a book called War from the Inside, the story of the 132nd Regiment, Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry in the War for the Suppression of the Rebellion, 1862 to 1863, by Frederick L. Hitchcock, late adjutant and major 132nd Pennsylvania Volunteers. His account of his regiment's activities at the Battle of Antietam is incredible. So, here we go. Chapter 5, The Battle of Antietam. Never did a day open more beautiful. We were astir at the first streak of dawn. We had slept, and soundly too, just where nightfall found us under the shelter of the hill near Keatysville. No reveille call this morning, too close to the enemy. Nor was this needed to arouse us. A simple call of a sergeant or corporal, and every man was instantly awake and alert. All realized that there was ugly business and plenty of it ahead. This was plainly visible in the faces as well as in the nervous, subdued demeanor of all. The absence of all joking and play and the almost painful sobriety of action, where jollity had been the rule, was particularly noticeable. Before proceeding with the events of the battle, I should speak of the night before the battle, of which so much has been said and written. My diary says that Lieutenant Colonel Wilcox, Captain James Archibald, Company I, and I slept together sharing our blankets, that it rained during the night. This fact with the other that we were close friends at home accounts for our sharing blankets. Three of us with our gum blankets could so arrange as to keep fairly dry, notwithstanding the rain. The camp was ominously still this night. We were not allowed to sing or make noise, nor have any fires except just enough to make coffee for fear of attracting the fire of the enemy's batteries. There was no need of such inhibition as to sing it or frolicking, for there was no disposition to a judge in either. Unquestionably, the problems of the morrow were occupying all breasts. Letters were written home, many of them last words, and quiet talks were had, and promises made between comrades, promises providing against the dreaded possibilities of the morrow. If the worst happens, Jack. Yes, Ned, send word to my mother and two. And these, she will prize them. And so directions were interchanged that meant so much. I can never forget the quiet words of Colonel Oakford as he inquired very particularly if my roster of the officers and men of the regiment was complete. For said he with a smile, we shall not all be here tomorrow night. I oh, say that with a smile. My goodness. We shall not all be here tomorrow night. Now to resume the story of the battle. We were here on the march about six o'clock and moved on, as I thought, rather leisurely for upwards of two miles crossing Antietam Creek, which our men had waded nearly waist deep, emerging, of course, soaked through. Our first experience of this kind. It was a hot morning, and therefore the only ill effects of this waiting was the discomfort to the men of marching with soaked feet. It was now quite evident that a great battle was in progress. A deafening pandemonium of cannonading with shrieking and bursting shells filled the air beyond us, towards which we were marching. An occasional shell whizzed by or over, reminding us that we were rapidly approaching the debatable ground. Soon we began to hear a most ominous sound which we had never heard before except in the far distance at South Mountain, namely the rattle of musketry. It had none of the deafening bluster or the cannonading so terrifying to new troops, but to those who had once experienced its effects, it was infinitely more to be dreaded. The fatalities by musketry at close quarters as the two armies fought at Antietam and all through the Civil War, as compared with those by artillery, are at least 100 to 1. Probably much more than that. These volleys of musketry we were approaching sounded in the distance like the rapid pouring of shot upon a tin pan, or the tearing of heavy canvas, with slight pauses interspersed with single shots, or desultory shooting. All this presaged fearful work in store for us, with what results to each personally the future, measured probably by moments, would reveal. How does one feel under such conditions? To tell the truth, I realized the situation most keenly and felt very uncomfortable. Lest there might be some undue manifestation 
manifestation of this feeling in my conduct, I said to myself, this is the duty I undertook to perform for my country, and now I'll do it, and leave the results with God. My greater fear was not that I might be killed, that I might be grievously wounded and left a victim of suffering on the field. The nervous strain was plainly visible upon us all. All moved doggedly forward in obedience to orders, in absolute silence so far as talking was concerned. The compressed lip, his set teeth showed that nervous and resolution had been summoned to discharge of duty. A few temporarily fell out, unable to endure the nervous strain, which was simply awful. There were a few others, it must be said, who skulked, took counsel of their cowardly legs, and despite all efforts of file closers and officers, left the ranks. Of these two classes, most of the first rejoined us later on, and their dropping out was no reflection of their bravery. The nervous strain produced by the excitement and danger gave them the malady called by the vets, the cannon, quick step. On our way into position, we passed by the Meyer Spring, a magnificent fountain of sweet spring water. It was walled in and must have been 10 or 12 feet square and at least 3 feet deep, and a stream was flowing from it large enough to make a respectable brook. Many of us succeeded in filling our canteens from this glorious spring, now surrounded by hundreds of wounded soldiers. What a godsend it was to those poor fellows. About eight o'clock we were formed into line of battle and moved forward through a grove of trees, but before the actually coming under musketry fire of the enemy we moved back again and swung around nearly a mile to the left to the base of a circular knoll to the left of the roulette farmhouse and the road which leads up to the Sharpsburg Pike near the Dunkard Church. The famous Sunken Road, a road which had been cut through the other side of this knoll, extended from the roulette lane directly in front of our line toward Sharpsburg. I had ridden by the side of Colonel Oakford, except when on duty, up and down the column, and as the line was formed by the colonel and ordered forward, we dismounted and sent our horses to the rear by a servant. I was immediately sent by the colonel to the left of our line to assist in getting into position. A rail fence separated us from the top of the knoll. Bullets were whizzing and singing by our ears, but so far hitting none where I was. Over the fence and up the knoll in an excellent line we went. In the center of the knoll, perhaps a third of the way up, was a large tree, and under and around this tree lay a body of troops doing nothing. They were in our way, but orders were forward, and through and over them we went. Reaching the top of the knoll, we were met by a terrific volley from the rebels in the sunken road down the other side, not more than 100 yards away, and also from another rebel line in a cornfield just beyond. Some of our men were killed and wounded by this volley. We were ordered to lie down just under the top of the hill and crawl forward and fire over, each man crawling back, reloading his piece in this prone position, and again crawling forward and firing. These tactics undoubtedly saved many lives, for the fire of the two lines in front of us was terrific. The air was full of whizzing, singing, buzzing bullets. Once down on the ground under the cover of the hill, it required very strong resolution to get up where the missiles of death were flying so thickly, yet that was the duty of us officers, especially us of the field and staff. My duty kept me constantly moving up and down that whole line. On my way back to the right of the line where I had left Colonel Oakford, I met Lieutenant Colonel Wilcox, who told me the terrible news that Colonel Oakford was killed. Of the details of his death, I had no time to then inquire. We were then in a very maelstrom of the battle, Men were falling every moment. The horrible noise of the battle was incessant and almost deafening, except that my mind was so absorbed in my duties. I don't know how I could have endured the strain. Yet out of this pandemonium, memory brings several remarkable incidents. They came and went with the rapidity of a quickly revolving kaleidoscope. You caught stupendous incidents on the instant, and in an instant they passed. One was the brave death of the major of this regiment that was lying idle under the tree. The commanding officer evidently was not doing his duty and this major was endeavoring to rally his men and get them at work. He was swinging his hat and cheering his men forward when a solid shot decapitated him. His poor body went down as though some giant had picked it up and furiously slammed it on the ground. And I was so near him that I could almost have touched him with my sword. The inaction of this regiment lying behind us under that tree was very demoralizing to our men, setting them a bad example. 
General Kimball, who commanded our brigade, was seated on his horse under the knoll of the rear of our regiment, evidently watching our work, and he signaled me to come to him and then gave me orders to present his compliments to the commanding officer of that regiment and direct him to get his men up and at work. I communicated this order as directed. The colonel was hugging the ground and merely turned his face towards me without replying or attempting to obey the order. General Kimball saw the whole thing and again called me to him and with an oath commanded me to repeat the order to him at the muzzle of my revolver and shoot him if he did not immediately obey. Said General Kimball, get those cowards out of there or shoot them. My task was a most disagreeable one, but I must deliver my orders and did so, but was saved the duty of shooting by the other officers of the regiment bravely rallying their men and pushing them forward to the firing line where they did good work. What became of that skulking colonel, I do not know. The air was now thick with smoke from the muskets, which not only obscured our vision of the enemy, but made breathing difficult and most uncomfortable. The day was excessively hot and no air stirring. We were forced to breathe this powder smoke, impregnated with saltpeter, which burned the coating of nose, throat, and eyes almost like fire. Captain Abbott, commanding Company G from Mock Chunk, a brave and splendid officer was carried to the rear, a ball having nearly carried away his under jaw. He afterwards told me that his first sensation of this awful wound was his mouth full of blood, teeth, and splintered bones, which he spat on the ground, and then found that unless he got immediate help, he would bleed to death in a few minutes. Fortunately, he found Assistant Surgeon Hoover, who had been assigned to us just from his college graduation, who, under the shelter of a haystack, with no anesthetic, performed an operation which Dr. Gross of Philadelphia afterwards said had been but once before successfully performed in the history of surgery and saved his life. Lieutenant Anson C. Cranmer of Company C was killed and the ground was soon strewn with the dead and wounded. Soon our men began to call for more ammunition and we officers kept busy taking from the dead and wounded and distributing it to the living. Each man had 80 rounds when we began the fight. One man near me rose a moment when a missile struck his gun about midway and actually capsized him. He pulled himself together and finding he was only a little bruised, picked up another gun with which the ground was now strewn and went at it again. Directly a lull in the enemy's firing occurred and we had an opportunity to look over the hill a little more carefully at their lines. Their first line in the sunken road seemed to be all dead or wounded and several of our men ran down there to find that literally true. They brought back the lieutenant colonel, a fine-looking man, who was mortally wounded. I shook his hand, and he said, God bless you, boys. You're very kind. He has be laid down in some sheltered place, for said he, I have but a few moments to live. I well remembered his refined, gentlemanly appearance, and how profoundly sorry I felt for him. He was young, lively built of sandy complexion, and wore a comparatively new uniform of Confederate gray, on which was embroidered the insignia of the 5th Georgia, CSA. He said, You've killed all my brave boys. They're there in the road. And they were. I saw them the next day lying four deep in places as they fell, a most awful picture of battle carnage. This lull was of very short duration, and like the lull of the storm, presaged a renewal of the firing with greater fury, for a fresh line of rebel troops had been brought up. This occurred three times before we were relieved. During the fiercest of the firing, another remarkable incident occurred which well illustrated the fortunes of war. I heard a man shouting, Come over here, men! You can see him better! And there, over the brow of the knoll, absolutely exposed, was Private George Corson of Company K, sitting on a boulder, loading and firing as calmly as though there wasn't a rebel in the country. I yelled at him to come back under the cover of the hilltop, but he said he could see the rebels better there, and refused to leave this vantage ground. I think he remained there until we were ordered back and didn't receive a scratch. His escape was nothing less than a miracle. He seemed to have no idea of fear. A remarkable fact about our experience during the fight was that we took no note of time. When we were out of ammunition and about to move back, I looked at my watch and found that it was 12.30 p.m. We had been under fire since 8 o'clock. I couldn't believe my eyes. I was sure my watch had gone wrong. I would have sworn that we had not been there more than 20 minutes when we'd actually been in that very hell of fire for four and a half hours. 
Just as we were moving back, the Irish Brigade came up under command of General Thomas Francis Meagher. They'd been ordered to complete our work by a charge, and right gallantly they did. Many of our men, not understanding the order, joined in that charge. General Meagher rode a beautiful white horse, but made a show of himself by tumbling off just as he reached our line. The boys said he was drunk, and he certainly looked and acted like a drunken madman. He regained his feet and floundered about, swearing like a crazy man. The brigade, however, made a magnificent charge and swept everything before it. Another incident occurred during the time we were under fire. My attention was arrested by a heavy-built general officer passing to the rear on foot. He came close by me and passed as he shouted. You'll have to get back. Don't you see yonder line of rebels is flanking you? I looked in the direction he pointed, and sure enough, on our right, and now well to the rear was an extended line of rebel infantry with their colors flying, moving forward with the precision of parade. They had thrown forward a beautiful skirmish line and seemed to be practically masters of the situation. My heart was in my mouth for a couple of moments, until suddenly the picture changed and their beautiful line collapsed and went back as if the damn devil was after them. They had run up against an obstruction in a line of boys in blue, and many of them never went back. This general officer who spoke to me, I learned, was Major General Richardson, commanding the 1st Division, then badly wounded, and who died a few hours later. Our regiment now moved back and to the right, some three quarters of a mile, where we were supplied with ammunition and the men allowed to make themselves a cup of coffee and eat hardtack. I was faint for want of food, for I had only had a cup of coffee early in the morning and was favored with hardtack by one of the men who were always ready and willing to share their rations with us. We now learned that our brigade had borne the brunt of a long and persistent effort by Lee to break our line at this point, and that we were actually the third line which had been thrown into this breach. The other two had been wiped away, out before we advanced. That as a matter of fact, our brigade, being composed so largely of raw troops, our regiment being really more than half the brigade was in actual number, was designed to be held in reserve. But the onslaught of the enemy had been so terrific that by 8 o'clock a.m. our reserve line was all that there was left and we had to be sent in. The other three regiments were veterans, old and tried. They had established reputation of having never once been forced back or whipped, but the 132nd was new and, except as to numbers, an unknown quantity. We had been unmercifully guyed during the two preceding weeks, as I've said before, as a lot of greenhorns, pretty boys, in pretty new clothes, and mama's darlings, etc, etc, to the end of the vet slang calendar. Now we had proved our mettle under fire. The atmosphere was completely changed, not the semblance of another jibe against the 132nd Pennsylvania Volunteers. We did not know how well we had done, only that we tried to do our duty under trying circumstances, until officers and men from other regiments came flocking over to congratulate and praise us. I didn't even know that we'd passed through the fire of a great battle until the Colonel of the 14th Indiana came over to condole us with the loss of Colonel Oakford, and incidentally told us that this was undoubtedly the greatest battle of the war thus far, and that we would probably never have such another. After getting into our new position, I at once began to look up our losses. I learned that Colonel Oakford was killed by one of the rebel sharpshooters just as the regiment scaled the fence in its advance up the knoll and before we had fired a shot. It must have occurred almost instantly after I left him with orders for the left of the line. I was probably the last to whom he spoke. He was hit by a mini ball on the left shoulder, just below the collarbone. The doctor said the ball had severed one of the large arteries, and he died in a very few minutes. He had been in command of the regiment a little more than a month, but during that brief time his work as a disciplinarian and drill master had made it possible for us to acquit ourselves as creditably as they all said we had done. General Kimball was loud in our praise and greatly lamented Colonel Oakford's death, whom he admired very much. He was a brave, able, and accomplished officer and gentleman and his loss to the regiment was irreparable. Had Colonel Oakford lived, his record must have been brilliant and his promotion rapid, for very few volunteer officers had so quickly mastered the details of military tactics and routine. He was a thorough disciplinarian, an able tactician, and the interests and welfare of his men were constantly upon his heart. 
My diary records the fact that I saw Captain Willard of the 14th Connecticut fall as we passed their line on our way to the rear, that he appeared to have been hit by a grape shot or piece of shell. I didn't know him, only heard that he was a brother of E.N. Willard of Scranton. The 14th Connecticut men said he was a fine man and a splendid officer. Among the wounded, reported mortally, was Sergeant Martin Hauer of Company K, one of our very best non-commissioned officers. I saw him at the hospital and it was very hard to be able to do nothing for him. It seemed our loss must reach upward of 200 killed, wounded, and missing. Out of 798 who answered to roll call in the morning, we had less with us than 300 at the close of the fight. Our actual loss was killed, officers, two, Colonel Oakford and Lieutenant Kramer, men, 28, total, 30. Wounded, officers, four, men, 110, total, 144. To this should be added at least 30 of the men who died of their wounds within the next few days, which would make our death loss in this battle upward of 60. Of the missing, many of them were those who joined the battle with the Irish Brigade in their charge, and who did not find us again for a day or so. It may seem strange that a man should not be able to find his regiment for so long, when really it is so close at hand. But when one remembers that our army of about 75,000 men had upward of 200 regiments massed within, say, two square miles, and that they were constantly changing positions, it will be seen that looking for any one regiment is almost like looking for a needle in a haymo. This has been an excerpt from War from the Inside, the story of the 132nd Regiment, Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry, in the War for the Suppression of the Rebellion by Frederick L. Hitchcock. Thanks for watching.